Although, you know, we're, we, uh, we listen to the government and it's good. Anyway, not going there today. We are in such a sensational uh, message series called Zeal. Who hasn't been, who's been enjoying it so far? Yeah? Loving it? Are you guys online, you can type in the comments as well. It's been awesome. Uh, they, it kicked off with uh, Pastor Sam, my awesome husband. Uh, he had all those props on stage which was like so cool. Uh, I don't have props today, but I do have other things that I'm going to treat you with, which I'll share in a little bit. Uh, But if you didn't get to see any of those messages in person, make sure that you tune in. Um, I think you can find them online because they are really great. And it's been shifting the culture of who we are as a people and who we are as a church. Like zeal is who are. It's who we're called to be. And unfortunately, the Canadian mindset, we can just become so apathetic without even realizing it. So we need to change ourselves. We need to change our spirits. We need to get some fire under our butts and get some zeal in us. And so I've been loving it. I'm so excited to share with you today as well. My message today is called Desperate Faith. Desperate faith, it's what we're called to have as people of God, is we're called to have desperate faith. So I want to just let you know quickly, because I don't know about you, but I'm starting to feel a little bit old, starting to kind of get there and be like, okay, some of these things that I remember were longer ago than I thought they were. Have you seen some of those memes? It's like, well, no, 1980 was only like, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. It was 40 it was 40 years ago now, which is crazy. I just shocked myself then. Jeez. Anyway, I wanted to ask you a quick question though. Where were you 12 years ago? So 2010. Where were you 12 years ago? It might not seem like that long, but trust me, it was. I don't know where you were. What were you doing for work in 2010? Maybe you weren't working yet. Maybe you were at school. Maybe you're in elementary school, some of you, 12 years ago. Who knows where you were? I got a picture actually up on this screen. This is Sam and I 12 years ago in 2010. Hello. The answer to that is, wow, you haven't aged a day. Was that taken last week? That's what I want to hear. I know, I know that's not the case. Uh, but this was us in 2010, actually. We were hosting um, a conference, and that's with the AWAs up the top. And do you know how hard it was to find a picture, actually, of us? Because I found out that Instagram actually hadn't been launched yet. Instagram actually launched in 2010. So I had to, like, go into the Facebook archives to try and find this one. Who appreciates Sam's fluffy hair and his, uh, his V-neck? That V-neck was actually probably one of the highest ones that he had. He definitely rocked many of the deep Vs in 2010. And uh, he didn't have any tattoos yet. And the cardigan. Oh, the cardigan. Who else used to wear a deep V with a cardigan? Admit it. In 2010? Yeah, a few of you. A few of you are too ashamed to admit it. But that's okay. So 12 years ago, 2010. It was a good year. iPads were released in 2010 as well. Isn't that crazy? I feel like we've, we've kind of had them forever, but it was only 12 years ago. But actually, that was a long time ago, the same time Instagram launched. And do you know what else launched in 2010? Was Justin Bieber released Baby in 2010. <laughs> Iconic. Changed the world forever. But how crazy is that to think just 12 years ago, we wouldn't have known who Justin Bieber was. I bet, I bet Sam didn't know who Justin Bieber was even five years ago, but that's Okay. He's, uh, he's not always there on the pop culture, but that's okay. But 12 years is actually quite a long time. Now, I would like some of the good stuff to have lasted 12 years. Like my skin, I hope, still looks the same 12 years from now. But some of this stuff, you don't want to be lasting for 12 years. Wherever you were 12 years ago, maybe there was pain or there was heartache, and it's still around 12 years later now. Or maybe, I don't know where you were at, maybe there is something else that you were going through and you wish that it hadn't lasted for these 12 years. I want to direct you to a story in the Bible. You can turn there right now in Mark 5. And you may have heard this story before, but I want to bring some fresh context to it. It's in Mark 5, verse 21 to 34. I might actually start in verse 24. Uh, To set the scene, basically a crowd was following Jesus 
because he's just been doing these incredible miracles, incredible works. So in verse 24, it says, a large, a large crowd followed and pressed around him. So maybe kind of like this crowd that we have here today, a crowd that was expecting, that was just like wanting to be around in Jesus' presence. That's what you guys are here today. And you guys online, you're part of this crowd that just wants to be around Jesus. Verse 25, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. 12 years of suffering. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had, all she had on this. And then yet, instead of getting better, not even getting just a little bit better, not even a sliver of better, instead of getting any better, she grew worse. 12 years of this suffering that was only growing worse and worse and worse. Verse 27, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. If I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Incredible story. And then verse 30, it says that once Jesus realised that power had actually gone from him, he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see there's people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? Like what a ridiculous question. In this room right now, Imagine if we were all, you know, not six feet apart. You wouldn't know who was touching or who was doing what. It's just, you know, crowds and it's fun and whatever. Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And this is my my favourite part. So he was trying to find her. And I believe this is why he was trying to find her, because he could have just let her go and just let her be healed. But he wanted to say something to her. He wanted to speak to her. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Now go in peace and be freed from your suffering. This would have been such a scary thing for this woman to have done. This would have been such an overwhelming thing for this woman to have done. I don't know about you, but crowds I find super overwhelming at times. You know, I mean, we don't seem to encounter crowds as much anymore, but whenever I'm in like a busy setting, I find it a little bit overwhelming. But to put myself in the shoes of this woman who is suffering with a problem that is so intimate as well, something that she could have so easily hidden. It's not something that you could see on the outside. There's people that were suffering from skin diseases where you would see that they were suffering from that. She could have hidden this. But she knew that she just, if she just could touch the hem of his garment, if she could just touch his robes, that she would be healed. And so she did. But there's something that stood out about her. And that is what we are. We are just like that crowd right now. But I want to ask, what is it that stood out about her? What made it so that her story was different to everybody else in that crowd? Instead of just experiencing Jesus, she experienced healing and she experienced uh, his voice directly into her life. So the first thing that I want to point out about this woman is that she was desperate. She was desperate, hence the title Desperate Faith. She was completely desperate. She had suffered a great deal under many doctors and spent all that she had, and yet grown worse. Can you imagine being in that position? She wasn't just, you know, had a problem and was just letting it be. She was trying her very hardest to do everything she could to try and get something, just just get it fixed, just get it sorted. She was trying all the doctors, and there's nothing wrong with doctors, but they couldn't fix it. She spent all of her money trying to fix it and it wouldn't fix it. It just grew worse. So she was desperate in that situation. And I don't know about you, but I could guarantee that every single person in this room has been in one of those desperate situations at times. Maybe you're in one right now. I know for myself, one of the earliest times 
that I can remember being truly just desperate and broken and at this like I just grew worse point was actually I was about 13 or 14 and my parents were going through quite a messy divorce and I was in a place of desperation. I don't know, I still to this day I don't know if I can truly nail what the feelings were but it would be loss, grief, um, unloved would be probably a feeling in there as well but just a feeling of complete desperation of my world falling apart as I knew it which when you're growing up your worldview is it's your family it's everything that you have so it just completely fell apart but not just fell apart it kind of blew up at the same time and then as the parents are going through a messy divorce you're just feeling like you're kind of left and for me it just caused so much pain and so much anger and frustration and sadness and depression, and I didn't know what to do with it. So like this woman, I saw many doctors. <laughs> I saw counsellors, which counsellors are amazing. I have an incredible counsellor that I see at the moment, but I was only growing worse at that time. I was only growing worse. I started to actually started dating boys in that period as well. I just... I don't think I thought it up here, but subconsciously now looking back, I can see that I was looking for some sort of love or validation or even just attention. And so that was when I started dating, which is not a great age to be starting to date, especially when they're older boys. But I also, I just grew worse. (laughs) I pushed harder in dance because I was a dancer at that time. I pushed harder and then I grew worse. (laughs) So then I gave up dance because I thought, well, maybe that was what was making me worse. But then giving it up, I grew worse. (laughs) And I wasn't finding solutions. I wasn't finding the fix. And I was in this desperate place and I couldn't even put words to it. And maybe you are there right now. And maybe there's part of you that thinks, because what I was feeling in that time (laughs) was I was feeling, this is just a divorce Everybody goes through this. I wasn't the only kid in my class whose parents had gone through a divorce. It's probably 80% of us had. There wasn't anything special or different about me going through this. So I should be able to just suck it up and be able to get through it. This is a normal part of life. And so instead of taking that desperation to God in those moments, I was actually diminishing it. But as I diminished it, it grew worse. (laughs) And so there is light at the end of the tunnel, which I will share with you in a little bit, but that's not the only time that I've had that desperation. I've had that desperation so many times since. I've had that desperation when we were struggling with infertility for years. I've had that desperation when we've been struggling financially. I've had that desperation when we've been struggling emotionally and just, you know, with just the craziness of life. I had that same desperation when we were struggling with postpartum anxiety. Like, these are real things that happen in this world that leave us in desperation. But I want to encourage us that the desperation is good. It's actually good for us. I want to encourage you that if you're feeling that desperation right now, don't try to let go of it. Don't try to diminish it because that's one thing that we do. We just diminish it and shove it down and tell ourselves it's not as bad as we think it is, but it is. And don't try to deal with it either. Don't try to do what this girl did and try to go everywhere else. But instead, when we're in that desperation, own it. It's good. We just need to direct it. We just need to direct our desperation to the right place. Imagine if that woman in that moment, if she had said to herself, you know what, it's not that bad. I've already lived with it for 12 years. I mean, after 12 years, I've got the hang of what this means for my life. I can keep going. I don't need to chase after Jesus right now. I've kind of got a handle on it. I know when I can do this and when I can't do this. And it's it's annoying and it's horrible, but I've learned to live with it. Imagine not being able to access her healing in that moment. So the desperation is good. Let's direct the desperation, though, to Jesus. Let's stay desperate. 
But the second thing that she had, she had her desperation, but she also had faith, which is the second point. Desperate faith, guys, desperation, and she had faith. She wasn't just desperate. There was something else going on in there. And this is like the thing. This is kind of what made it different. This is what made her different to everybody else in the crowd. In Mark 5, 28, it says, because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. If I can just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And then you see at the end of the story in verse 34, this is what Jesus says, daughter, your faith has healed you. He didn't say, I healed you. Isn't that crazy? Jesus had every right to say, I have healed you, because he did. But he actually put it back on her and he said, it's because of your faith. Your faith is what has healed you. It's incredible. So I just think how much it would have taken for her to get to that point. Because when you are so desperate to hold on to even a sliver of faith can be so difficult. It can be the hardest thing to do. I can't imagine how exhausted she would have been from all of the doctors or tired or weary or filled with shame even. For her to be able to push through a crowded place, feeling all of that emotion, but she just had this sliver of faith (laughs) That if I can just get there, if I can just touch his clothes, it would change everything. There's this one um, line actually in the same story, but in Luke 8.43, there's a a line that gets added into the story here. And it says, um, she had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. And when I read that, it like, it stood out to me. How many times... Have we believed a lie about our situation and then just owned it instead? Even the Bible had the truth in here that no one could heal her but God. But God. What is that lie that you are believing or that we are believing right now? Maybe it's that could never be done. It's never been done before. That's never been the way it's worked in my life. You'll be this way forever. You'll have this thing forever. This is just a thorn in your flesh that you're meant to deal with. You'll have to live with this issue. It's not going anywhere, but that's okay. You know, you'll be fine. No, sliver, just a sliver of faith. (laughs) Find it on the inside of ourselves so that we can go after the hem of God because but God... (laughs) No one could heal her, and yet she got healed just a few verses later. What is that thing right now that is telling you will never happen? Because I tell you what, a few verses later, it's going to be a testimony in your life. So good. So the other thing that I love that she did here with her faith, I love that she owned her faith. So, so often (laughs) we can see uh, Jesus and we can see everything that's going on and we can want him to come to us. And yes, he does that because he is incredible and he is faithful and he is loving and he does come after us and want to be in relationship with us. But there's something that he wants sometimes from us where he wants us to take a stand. He wants us to take a step. So she could have been in that crowd and not received her healing. But she received it because she took a step. If only I can just reach out. And how often are we like, oh, if only Jesus could meet me here right now. Oh, if only he could change that situation. Oh, if only he could do this. If only he could do that. Jesus, be with me. They're great prayers. I'm not trying to diss them, but maybe when it comes to desperate faith, there's something inside of us that we've got to get up and be like, nah, if only I can do this, if only I can reach out, if only I can step into the presence, if only I can do this. So how does that actually look? 
How does it tangibly look? It is actually fighting with faith. So in 1 Timothy 6.12, it says, fight the good fight of faith. What she was doing when she was stepping through the crowd and battling everything that she was battling, she was actually fighting with faith. She was fighting the good fight of faith. There is aggression to do with that. She had faith and she had a fight. And so for me personally, this comes with the way I fight and the way I see it outworking in my life is fighting in a bunch of different ways. Fighting my emotions to get into His presence. That's one way that I need to fight. Instead of sitting there and going, God, like, just fill me up. It's like, no, you know what? I am not sad right now. I am not depressed right now. I am seeking after your presence and I'm fighting through my emotions because they do not dictate my world. Maybe it's fighting my tiredness to pray in the morning. Hello? We need to fight ourselves sometimes to get into God's presence. I need to fight my busy schedule to carve out time to be with Him and to be in His presence. I need to fight my thought patterns to renew my mind. That's actually my job, (laughs) is that I need to renew my mind through reading His Word, through being in His presence, through being in worship. There's a responsibility that I have to own, that I fight for my faith. Maybe it's also fighting the lies that come in, fighting the noise, the distractions, the shame and the embarrassment. These are the ways I fight. And my guess is that a lot of you would be feeling the same way. I also have to fight my selfishness. Sometimes I find myself praying like the I deserve prayers and the I'm justified prayers. <laughs> I'm like, nope, you are right, Lord. I need to fight my selfishness in this situation and be selfless. She was fighting for her faith, but she was also fighting for connection. So she said, if only I can, if only I can, that's her owning it, if only I can just, that's her sliver of faith. She didn't need Jesus to do much else, so just if only I can just. But then it was if I can just touch his robe. She wasn't satisfied with just being in his presence. She wanted the connection. She wanted to touch his robe. She wanted to feel him. She wanted to be like as close to Jesus as she could possibly get because she knew that that's where it was the breakthrough was going to come from. That's where the anointing was, not just to be in the crowd and be amongst it, although that would have been so amazing to see and be a part of, but for her to get that healing, the actual touching and the connection of his, uh, of his robe. And the thing is, is that that moment in connection with Jesus and in His presence, and in that intimate moment, it is insanely healing. When we have fought to get there, and then we step into that place, it is amazing, the faithfulness of God to us. In Psalm 84.10, just to give you a little context, it says, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. And then Psalm 16, 11, you make known the path of life, uh, make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. There is nothing like the presence of God. There is nothing like being in connection, like touching His actual garment. It's a place of intimacy, a place of peace, a place of rest, a place of joy, a place of healing. There's nothing like it. Nothing compares. And so back to that story of going through the divorce with my parents, there was this moment for me, and I'm reminded of it because it made such an impact for me that I go back there all the time. And it's this moment. So I was invited to a youth conference which, oh my gosh, we need to get youth going in this church. Amen. Youth leaders, speak to us. It's happening. It's going to happen. It's amazing. But there was this moment and I was invited to a conference by friends. 
And I mean, I want to say that that just means so much. (laughs) They didn't know the entirety of what I was going through. They didn't know everything, but they knew that I needed to get to the place, which is just like what we've we've talked before about the story of the four men that lowered uh, their friend through the roof. They like dug the hole and through the roof. And then Jesus in that story says, their faith healed the guy. Which is, you know, you don't know what your invite is doing. You invite someone to church and your faith for them might actually be their healing, which is mind-blowing for me. So my friends invited me to this conference and at the end there was this moment where uh, the worship team, which, shout out to worship teams, man, they bring the presence of God. They had written a new song and to this day I can recite the exact words of the song I don't even remember who was preaching. Whoever was preaching invited people down the front and just said, you know what, if you're in a desperate moment and if you're just, you know, life is just crazy right now, I can't even remember what they said. But they said, come down to the front and just be in God's presence. And I knew that I needed it. My heart was leaping out of my chest. I felt like this woman where I was in this crowd, I was embarrassed, I was ashamed, Remember, I had tried to diminish that feeling of like, you know, it's just a divorce. Why am I struggling with this so much? And I was so ashamed, but I went down. I had that sliver of faith and my gosh, I'm thankful that I did. I went down the front. I don't even remember if anybody prayed for me. Someone might have, I don't know. But there was this, as the worship team sang the lyrics, I felt the tangible presence of God at 14 years old just feel fill every single part of my heart. Fill parts that I didn't even realise were that broken or that hurt and fill me with comfort, fill with love. I felt like things, like it felt like things were kind of breaking off me that had like held me. I I don't even know exactly how to explain it, except even now, all these years later, I can close my eyes and I can picture the exact spot that I was at the front. I can hear the exact words and the exact voice that was singing over at the time. And I'm like transported back there again and reminded of His goodness. I am reminded of His healing power. I am reminded of how much He loves me and cares for me and how much His presence is like nothing else I could ever experience. No matter what I'm going through, no matter how hard life is, that that exists. (laughs) That I can access His tangible presence at any moment, wherever I am. And that specific moment is like a key marker For me, in that moment, in His presence, everything changed. My life completely changed. It was one way before where I had kind of felt the presence of God. I sort of knew what it was, but I had never felt it heal me like I had in that moment. And it changed me. And I have been able to access that in so many more times of desperation since. Every other time that I've hit desperation, I'm reminded of that moment, of that sliver of faith. I'm reminded that I can step out. I'm reminded that I can fight with my faith. And I'm reminded that He meets me there, that He is faithful to meet me there. So the last point then is that her life is changed forever. This wasn't just some quick healing where great, now, awesome, now she's not bleeding. Woohoo, like party on. As you heard before, there was a little bit more to it. He wanted to speak into her. He didn't want her to just walk away and be healed. He wanted to in, like impart something into her. So he remember he said, daughter, your faith has healed you. Now go in peace and be freed from your suffering. One encounter with Jesus will change your life forever, without a doubt. There is not a sliver of doubt in me that would ever say that. Without a doubt, a moment in His presence will change you forever. So I said earlier, where were you 12 years ago? Imagine her 12 years of shame, 12 years without peace, 
12 years of feeling like an outcast and all changed in that moment. So where were you 12 years ago? What are you still carrying that Jesus wants you free of? What are you carrying? What pain, what fear, what anxiety, depression, health issues? What have you learned to live with? What have you tried to deal with on your own? Financial struggles, relationship difficulties, trauma, insecurity, doubt, double-mindedness, anger, the list goes on. There are so many to list. And maybe you've dealt with it for 12 years. Maybe you've dealt with it for 20 years. Maybe it's only just started to come up in the last week. It does not matter how long that you've been dealing with it. There is healing that is here today and your life will be forever changed but it won't just be healing because I believe that there is more that Jesus wants for us it is healing but it is also identity he said daughter he was very clear to direct it straight to her daughter and that's what he did for me at that altar at that moment on the on the front at that church he spoke identity into who I was. I was believing so many other things. I was dismissing things. I was thinking that I was weak because I couldn't deal with it. I was thinking that, you know, all of the horrible things that you could be thinking about yourself. But He spoke to her and He spoke to me, daughter, that's the only identity that you need to carry or son (laughs) is whose you are, is that He loves you and that He cares. And then not only that, so He heals her, then her identity is changed and then she's filled with peace. So he recognised that, you know what, this isn't just a physical healing, but every time there's physical difficulties, there's always emotional and um, all the other stuff that goes with it. So he didn't just say, you've been healed, go and, go and do your thing. He said, daughter, and then he said, go and in peace. So all the shame is gone. All the emotional difficulties that are attached to this physical healing, it's all gone. That there is peace that you can live in, that you are free. And then the last thing, you are free from her suffering. She no longer had to suffer. Suffering was all that she'd known for 12 years. Could have been so easy for her to just think that this is my life, or maybe I'm not suffering from this, but you know, just suffering is going to be a part of my life. No, daughter, go in peace. You are free from your suffering. It's incredible. So I don't know where you are right now, but I want to encourage you. Why not today? Why not let today be that day that we push through the crowd, that we get a little bit uncomfortable, that we fight through any insecurities or anything that we're dealing with, fight with faith and get to Jesus if we can just touch His robe, if we can just be in His presence. And so right now, actually, why doesn't everybody just close your eyes, bow your head. I want to give you a moment right now. And the reason why I ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads is this is a moment between you and Jesus. So please respect, don't look around. This is just between you and Jesus. And His presence is here right now. It feels like comfort, it feels like peace, it feels sometimes like a washing away of things and it's here right now but as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I want to give you the opportunity right now to start a relationship with Jesus or maybe come back into relationship with Him. Then maybe you're saying, you know what, I want to walk with Jesus. I'm done. I don't want to do this on my own anymore. And so if that's you in the room right now, I just want you to raise your hand while every head is bowed and every eye is closed. If you want to start a relationship with Jesus or if you want to come back into relationship with Him, just raise your hand right now and we're going to just pray with you in a little bit. Thank you. I, I see your hand in the, in the back middle. Thank you. I see that hand as well. I'm just, there's a few people as hands three hands, four. I'm struggling to see you all, but it's between you and Jesus anyway. But the reason I'm saying is that there's four hands is because I want you to know that you're not alone. 
You're in a great church here with people who love you and care about you. So I'm just going to give you one more opportunity. If that is you, just raise your hand right now if you want to start a relationship with Jesus or come back in relationship with Him. It's beautiful. Awesome. Well, why doesn't everybody just uh, stand up? We're just going to pray together with those people. I am so incredibly proud of every single... Yeah, you can praise Jesus. It's pretty awesome. I'm just so incredibly proud of every single person who raised your hand. I guarantee you that your life will not be the same from this moment on. It's not going to be all peachy, sweet and perfect and clouds and rainbows and butterflies, but it will be different because you have Jesus walking with you. So we're going to pray this prayer together as a church. We're going to stand. We're going to pray loud so that we can hear ourselves through our masks. And we're just going to stand with these people. And if you made that decision today, I want these words to be your personal words to Jesus. So just repeat after me. Say, Dear Jesus, I invite you into my heart today. I thank you that you died on the cross to set me free. I repent of my past. Wash me clean. Make me new. And help me follow you as Saviour and as Lord of my life from this day forward. Amen. Amen. It's awesome. So proud of you. So good.